Many of us who have grown up in Sunday school would remember the thrill and excitement felt when stories of great Bible heroes were told, like Abraham with Isaac on the altar of sacrifice, Noah and the flood, Moses and the burning bush, Joshua and the walls of Jericho, the parting of the Red Sea, Samson and Delilah, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, uh, Elijah calling down fire from heaven, and so on. And to us then, those stories were not only sensational to us, the hearers, but uh, we treat them as another reading of Grimm's fairy tale. It is my sincere belief that even up to this moment, uh, many have grown up still perceiving some of those stories as unreal as they used to be to them then. The title of my message today is Taken 900 Miles Away From Home. And I'm attempting to take Daniel, one of those sensational biblical heroes of Daniel in the Lion's Den fame. I want to take him out of the list, as it were, put flesh and blood on his story in order that we, we may be able to see him as someone who was actually a real part of human history, someone who actually lived 2,600 years ago and whose life is most, most relevant to every last one of us today. Now, my text is taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. But I'm not going to read it. I will just make some references as I go along. Now, the book of Ezekiel comes before the book of Daniel in chronology, and it is important important for us to know that historically and contextually, both of them, they both overlap somewhat. So let me frame some of the historical context for us. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he besieged, besieged Israel for uh, over a period of 20 years, which culminated in the ultimate destruction of the city of Jerusalem, which was the capital city in 586 BC. Now, he really made three incursions into Judah. The first was uh, under our, uh, Joachim, when he was the king, and uh, that took place in 606 BC. And it was in that first incursion that Daniel was carried away to Babylon. The second incursion was in 598 BC in which Ezekiel was carried away. And uh, the third incursion in 588 BC in which Jerusalem was destroyed and Zedekiah carried away to Babylon. Now, about 105 years earlier in the year 712 BC, it was the prophet Isaiah who foretold of Judah falling into the hands of the Babylonians. You would remember in the account that King Hezekiah, he was sick and he prayed to God God granted him 
is wish, wish he recovered from the sickness and God extended his life for 15 more years. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, it was Hezekiah, he was the king to whom uh, Isaiah prophesied those words to. And uh, hear what, uh, what that prophecy contained. Behold, Isaiah told him, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now that was more than a hundred years before it actually happened. And I included that prophecy just to show us the accuracy of God's word, the Bible, and that God, he always settles accounts with those who refuse to respond to his warnings given time and time again. So, over the course of 20 years, Nebuchadnezzar, he besieged Israel and took captive th tens of thousands of Jews. He deported them to Babylon, where they would end up spending <clears throat> the next 70 years. Now, among some of the Jews, or the first uh, Jewish captives, um, that Nebuchadnezzar took prisoner were four young men, four teenagers called Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and uh, Azariah. That was their Hebrew names. Daniel and his three companions, they were called children in verse 4 of our text. Uh, and according to Eastern etiquette and protocol, in order to be a courtier, to work in the court of the king, they had to be about 20, uh, 12 years of age um, for a particular purpose. Uh, and some Bible scholars even put that age of um, between 13 and 15 years. So the book of Daniel is the story of the life of Daniel and the faithfulness of God in the midst of a very, very difficult time for Israel. So Daniel is deported from Judah and he is living in Babylon. And that is nine years before Ezekiel the prophet gets there himself. Now, Ezekiel's ministry there in Babylon was primarily to serve as God's prophet amongst the exiles living there, and uh, um, Babylon is today modern, in modern Iraq. <coughs> now, while Ezekiel's primary ministry was amongst the exiles, the place of Daniel's primary ministry was in the palace of the king. God had strategically placed both Daniel and Ezekiel in Babylon in order to fulfill his promise in a foreign and pagan culture and under a despot, under a tyrant, and under an evil king called Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, uh, the record tells us that Daniel starts off serving King Nebuchadnezzar and also successive kings after him uh, until uh, there comes a Persian king on the throne called uh, King Cyrus, uh, whom Daniel ministers to and serves. Uh. Now, God has strategically place, you know, 
those two guys, uh, Daniel and Ezekiel, in very unique roles in exilic Babylon. Ezekiel, as I said, was planted amongst the Jewish exiles to challenge and encourage them, while Daniel had been placed in the palace of the king, where he will have influence over those Gentile pagan kings. Now, the book of Daniel covers about 70 years of history, and it begins with the Babylonian um, empire in power. But by the end of the book of Daniel, the Babylonians have been conquered by the Persians. And it was at that time, near the end of Daniel's life, that he wrote this book of Daniel uh, while he had been in captivity. And uh, because of its uh, strong prophetic content uh, concerning uh, the end times, uh, the book of Daniel is often referred to as the Apocalypse of the Old Testament. So, here is this young man, Daniel. He has tremendous courage and tremendous convictions in the midst of a very, very challenging environment. But he is a man of principles and values. He is a man of faith who remains loyal and true to God above everyone and everything else. So here is this boy Daniel taken captive, probably about the age of 15. He is deported to Babylon, roughly 900 miles away from his home in uh, Judah. Now he is separated from his country, he is separated from his family, he is separated from his native language and his lifestyle, and he is here thrust into a foreign pagan culture. Uh, different language, different lifestyle, even different gods. So this is where he finds himself now. And it is not by his own choice, but, you know, he is held cap captive and forced uh, into Babylonian exile. Now, it is here that he has to find his life. But it is here also where the Babylonians are uh, wanting him and the other Jewish exiles to become absorbed into their culture, absorbed into their values, into their language, into their mindset, and uh, eventually absorbed into worshipping their false gods. But here is Daniel, and he is fully resolved not to bend in the direction of all of that. He is resolved not to suck succumb to the temptation of his new environment. He is going to resist all the cultural and political pressure, the pressures that are trying to con conform him to that new environment and that new culture. That is why this book of Daniel is timeless because every single one of us will be confronted my friend with the with an ever present temptation to become just like the culture around us as a follower of Christ as a Christian we will always be confronted with the sense of Whose are we? Are we the world's or are we the Lord's? Who do we really belong to? See, and to whom then will we be most loyal? Again, who is it that really defines us and shapes us and molds us? Will it be the Lord or will it be 
the world and the culture around us? Will, will it be the environment uh, to which we are being exposed? Uh, so this is really Daniel's story. And quite frankly, this is also our story as well. It is about a man who was not afraid of the consequences for resisting the political and cultural pressures on him, which were coming and assaulted him from every side. See, it is about a man and his conviction to honor and please God, and that always outweighed the fear and the pressure to please man. So Daniel, he was a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. Now, this is a very important principle, uh, even for our lives today. See, he was always under the conviction to honor and please God, more than the temptation to fear and please man. So he lived for the glory of God, even at that young, tender age of 15. Now, truth be told, all of us, we all fear rejection and we really crave acceptance. All of us want to be accepted, yes? All of us want to fit in. All of us want to find approval in the eyes of people. Now, I know that that is a dangerous thing, but it is really just an admission that all of us, something that all of us ought to recognize, that nobody wants to feel like the odd man out. And for that very reason, it is so very easy to become seduced by the existing culture around us because nobody wants to really feel odd. Nobody wants to feel alienated. So the trend to be seduced by the culture around us, the pressure to live in society today and the pressure of the environment, they are all constantly assaulted us. And it was the very same situation for Daniel as, as well way back then. Now, this is what happens to us when we succumb, when we give in to those pressures that are assaulting us. See, when we constantly feel the pressure and the, the, uh, 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 and the temptation to conform and uh, eventually we give in, this is really what happens. When we eventually succumb to the molding and the pressure of the culture and the environment in which we live, that continuous uh, systematic seduction renders us irrelevant within our culture and renders us also irrelevant and ineffective for the kingdom of God as well. Now, whenever Christ followers end up living like the world, talking like the world, looking like the world, smelling like the world, and doing what the world does, uh, we would have really surrendered uh, to the subtle tactic uh, of the enemy, which is to make us irrelevant and ineffective for the kingdom of God. That's why, you know, God is always calling men and women and young people to stand up for what is right, to stand up for what is true and godly and righteous and honorable, to stand up for what brings honor and glory to God and to resist the constant pull of culture and uh, the environment uh, to take us away from the things of God. Uh, see, now Daniel, he is thrust into that very kind of culture 
that very kind of environment, uh, see, and uh, against, uh, which is really, uh, uh, everything is against his, his will, uh, what he stands for. So he resists, he, he runs cross grade uh, to the status quo. He is really swimming upstream against a very, very dangerous current uh, because here he is taken captive. He is taken away from his comfort, taken away, taken away from all that he is familiar with. Uh, and here he is thrust into a culture which is very opposite to what he has been used to. Different gods, a, a different language, a, different experiences, all of that. Uh, and he's got, uh, you know, a life-changing decision to make. So he muses, am I going to be absorbed into my new life and into my new surroundings? Or should I just flow with it and give in? Or am I still going to be a principled man, you know, with all of my values intact, with my faith intact, and my loyalty to God intact? Am I going to be that kind of man? Am I going to be the kind of man that will please God no matter the circumstances? Or am I going to be a man who become molded by my environment, shaped by my environment, pressed into its mold? Now, in this book, in this account, Daniel here stands as a wonderful, wonderful example for all of us today. So we've really got to get a proper perspective on what, you know, is about to follow from this point onwards. The Babylonians, they rose to power by defeating the Assyrians that were before them and trying to create this uh, reference, a context for us to understand better some of the things that are, as I said, are going to be following here. So here it is. The Babylonians, they rose to power by defeating the Assyrians uh, that were before them. Uh, and, uh, you know, those, um, the Babylonians, uh, they wage their warfare radically different from how the Assyrians uh, wage their warfare. Because the Assyrians, history tells us, uh, were a brutal, ruthless people. They were going to a town, conquer that town, pillage it, rape the women, flay the men, uh, and make slaves of the children. Uh, now, history tells us that the Assyrians, uh, they would actually skin men alive uh, and use their hides as wallpaper to adorn their homes. Now, when they took people captive, they would string them together by their, uh, by their noses and haul them for hundreds of miles uh, taking them back to their own territory in Babylon. So they were very ruthless. They were very brutal people. On the contrary, whenever the Babylonians conquered a country, they would employ a completely different kind of military strategy. See, they would employ what is referred to as seductive tactics. Now, here is what they will do. They will take you captive, but they will not put hooks through your noses like the Assyrians. See, they will just lead you for 900 miles 
as uh, the, uh, they did with the captives from Jerusalem, because from Jerusalem to Babylon, uh, 900 miles. So they would lead you for 900 miles until you came to the ancient city of Babylon, where you would be enamored uh, with the opulence and the beauty and the splendor of that great city. Now, once you got there, you, I am sure, you will not want to go anywhere else. Because you would be looking around wide-eyed. You would be like, uh, wow, where, this, where did, did all of this come from? This place is super beautiful. And uh, the Babylonians, they would respond, uh, and you get to live here too. So please come on in, come and eat our food, enjoy our homes, settle down, start raising families. This is a good place to be, a very good place to be. It's truly a beautiful place. And uh, all the captives, you know, would be like, yeah, I cannot, I really cannot believe my eyes. This place is truly, truly beautiful. The ancient historian Herodotus, on record, he described the splendor of Babylon and he did it during the waning days of Babylon. So you could imagine from the account, which I'll refer to, uh, to in a moment, uh, you could only imagine what it would have been like in the glory days of Babylon. This is how we describe Babylon as a city. It was 200 miles in square along the Euphrates River. Uh, there were nearly 60 miles of a wall around the city. 400 feet high and 80 feet thick. There were 100 brass gates and 225 towers. He also states that the Euphrates River was diverted under the wall of, uh, and uh, into the city. So it would be like uh, this beautiful meandering river going right through the uh, the city. Now, he goes on to state that rising from the center of the city of Babylon was this pyramid-like structure called the Ziggurat, which was really a temple tower that was used for religious purposes. Now, it was a terraced, you know, structure, terrace steps. And on each terrace, there were planted beautiful, beautiful gardens, so that you would look at this magnificent, beautifully flowered pyramid-like structure that rose 400 feet up into the atmosphere, uh, in the air, and you would look at that kind of thing with a great awe. Now, that is really what gave rise to, um, to that, that whole structure, that garden structure, uh, being called one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which we know as the hanging, um, the hanging gardens of Babylon. Now, I want you to imagine this scenario. As a Jew, you have been transported 900 miles from Jerusalem. And you have, you know, traversed scorching, dry, sandy, barren deserts and uh, an, an unforgiving wilderness that were filled with poisonous snakes and dangerous wild animals. So here you are, 
after that long, long journey that would have taken uh, weeks, months, you are exhausted, tired, and hot as you enter those majestic gates of the city. And as you enter, you behold those stately palm trees. You see the Euphrates River and the hanging gardens of Babylon. It's like, man, you stepped into a magic kingdom, Disney World. You hear the music, you smell the hot dogs roasted there, and the smell of popcorn and cotton candy, and you tell yourself, man, this is fun, this is the life, this is super wonderful. Now, that was the vintage Babylonian style warfare that greeted the captives as they entered the city. They would seduce you with beauty and splendor, and before you knew it, you would be absorbed into their culture, and after some time, you would become just like them. Just like them. That's exactly how they did it. But despite all of that, the Bible says that Daniel resisted it all. He refused to be molded and shaped by his new environment. He would spend, you know, the rest of his life right there in Babylon. But he, you see, would never ever bend. He would never ever conform. He lived in Babylon, but he would never allow Babylon to live in him. See, and we need to recognize the same thing today, that we are in the world, Jesus said, but not of the world. So here was Daniel living in Babylon, but he honored his God right there in that hostile environment. He was true to Jehovah God. God in a very uncompromising way. And what really amazes me is, is this, and if you are listening to this and you are a teenager, hear this, Daniel, he is 15 years of age when he is taken from his home in Israel and carried away captive to Babylon. And that was 900 miles away, I said. And he lived there until the age of 85, 90. In fact, he died there in Babylon as well. But not once in all his years, not once. And uh, I want you to know, like all of us, he was not a perfect person. But not once is there any record in that book of uh, 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 Daniel being compromised in any way at all uh, because he remained true and faithful to the Lord. He remained true to the Lord uh, whether he was a teenager because he went there uh, at age 15 or whether it was later down the road uh, as a senior or a pensioner in Babylon. Uh, he was just as faithful to God, my friend, in every season of his life, as I said, from a young boy to a very old man. So if you are here this morning, whether you are from the younger end of the spectrum or from the more mature end of the spectrum, you have a responsibility and I have a responsibility because I want you to know that it is possible to live in Babylon without Babylon living in you. Now, we all know that in any warfare, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Hear what Romans 12 tells us. Be not conformed to this world. Another translation puts it like this. Do not let the world 
press you into its mold, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind in the Word of God. So, in order, my friend, for you to beat the odds of the world trying to conform you uh, or press you into its mold, you have to see and understand some of the tactics that the Babylonians employed to try to get people to conform and to be molded and to be shaped into the image of that new environment. Now, here are three tactics that Babylon used. Babylon is a type of the world. Three tactics that they use to try to press people into their mold. Number one, physical isolation. They will take you away from your country, away from your family, your language, your culture, away from your God, and away from everything familiar to you. They will take you to Babylon and isolate you. Now, eventually, see, separation seduces you. Seduces you to abandon the way you used to live and to take on now the values, the principles, the standards that are in that place. And eventually, you are going to be bowing to the gods and idols that they serve. Now, it's a slow process, admittedly, and it is also a very subtle one. See, that's the danger. It is like the frog in the kettle syndrome, that principle where you are dying slowly and you are not even aware of it. So that's the danger of becoming a lukewarm Christian. You think that you are okay when you are not. Now, that is exactly what happens to Christians who isolate and separate themselves from the fellowship of the saints in the church. It is, you know, just like uh, how the lion uh, isolates the, the sheep from the rest of the flock and then goes for the kill, so too the enemy of our souls, the Bible says he is like a roaring lion searching for whosoever he can devour. See, he uses the vehicle of offenses. He uses the vehicle of lies and excuses to isolate a member of the church. And then, when he gets you in that place, he comes in for the kill. Yes, it gets worse and worse. It doesn't get better. See, Christians who isolate themselves from the fellowship, they go deeper and deeper and deeper deeper into a pit. They just deceive themselves into believing that, yes, they still have a religious life, but I want you to know, biblically, you cannot have a spiritual or, or a biblical life without fellowship in the church. It is the church that Jesus himself gave his life for. So, isolation weakens you and it gradually erodes the very uh, uh, values that you once stood for. When you are isolated, you tend to become more yielding, more malleable, easier to be shaped and molded into the values and culture and way of life that is around you. You become more and more, your feet get uh, deeper and deeper into the world and you 
are not even aware that is happening because it is slow and it is subtle. It is deceptive. That is the reason, one of the main reasons why God says, do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves as the manner of some is. Now, hear there, God specifically uses the expression assembling together, not just assembling. You see, because some people, they just assemble. They just assemble and what they really resist is the assembling together because assembling together involves the process of, of building close community and relationship. That is what together means, uh, one dovetailing into the other, becoming closer and closer. See, now it takes time, it takes regularity, it takes consistency, it takes commitment, it takes love and sacrifice and dying to self and caring to build community and to build uh, relationships. It takes giving up your rights uh, at, uh, at times uh, just for the sake of, of preserving healthy relationships. So you could be just assembling and still be isolated. God says, assemble together. There is a unity because we are baptized by one spirit into one unity. Yes. See? But, you know, community always bring believers into close fellowship with each other. And wherever there is true fellowship, there's always transparency and accountability within the group. Yeah, we, we, we become accountable to each other. See, we, we miss Bible class, we miss prayer meeting, we always uh, looking out for each other. Uh, somebody uh, did not attend for a week or two, uh, um, you, you call up and you look out for each other. That is what community is all about. Uh, that is what uh, uh, accountability is all about. Uh, so in a real sense, fellowship, true fellowship protects. Now this is what the Bible says about the early church in Book of Acts. And they continued steadfastly, notice this, steadfastly it wasn't you know once in a while and it continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine so the ministry of the word was key was number one priority in their lives there are some people they come to church they sit and listen but they don't listen they don't receive the word of God. The word of God is not priority for them. It is not something critical. But in the early church, they, 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 they continued steadfastly, firstly, in the apostles' doctrine. That is all that Jesus taught them. The word of God, the ministered word of God. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship. And the Greek word is koinonia. That is family, my friend, that is close relationship, koinonia. Then they continued in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, let me say this. It may shock some of you, but there's no way that you can pray and be out of fellowship. There's no way that you can pray and God will answer your prayer and be isolated from the rest of the fellowship. It does not work that way. In fact, uh, Jesus said in um, Matthew's gospel, he says, 
if you bring your gift to the altar for like like prayer like you come to pray and you remember that your brother has ought against you. he says leave the gift at the altar go make it up with your brother resolve that relationship issue and then come back and offer your worship then come back and offer your prayer that's how god instituted it and you cannot play you see by your own rules you've got to do it by the book so here is daniel playing by the rules grounded by the rules and when the occasion demanded it he rises to the occasion he refuses to conform because he was ready he was 15 and he was ready see now you got to get this you know he didn't get strong like that overnight there got to be people who would have poured into his life so that is one of the things that fellowship does my friend it builds and strengthens and encourages he had people in his life besides mother and father and grandma and granddad there would have been other people who would have poured into his life to make him that kind of of giant spiritual giant even at the age of 15 for him to for him to be able to withstand all the assault of his new environment yes now he you will realize that he was equipped for the work of the ministry simply because he would have gone to church regularly because that is what fellowship does god has given to the church uh, the fivefold ministries for the uh, equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry so that is what church does there's no way that you can be isolated, be a loner, infrequent in your attendance at church and still say that you are strong in your faith, that you are a strong Christian. It does not happen like that. So as young as he was, Daniel, he was equipped for the situation, for the work of the ministry, and he was ready. Now, every single one of us who live in a real world and work at a real job, you go to a real school and you function in a real neighborhood, you will know that your values, your faith, and your principles would constantly be under assault by the culture and environment around you. Because Babylon, my friend, which is a type of this world, the world is not interested in helping you to grow your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. That responsibility is on you. Babylon is not going to come alongside you and say, well, let me help you read your Bible. Oh, let me help you pray. Do you want to go to church? We'll take you there. The world is not going to do that. No, not at all. Not at all. The world will just continue assaulting you, assaulting you, assaulting you. So you've got to know who you really are down here. See, because the, world, the world's goal is to intentionally or unintentionally put separation between you and the Lord. That's the isolation. If the world and the environment and the culture around us can just isolate you away from the Lord, isolate you from your Bible, and your prayer and your fellowship with the church the result is that you become weakened you become lukewarm 
you become backslidden, you become all of that in your faith, and you do not even realize it uh, until it's too late, much too late. You do not even realize uh, that you are almost being absorbed uh, into your environment uh, and you are almost uh, being pressed uh, into the world's mold. So it is important, so important uh, for you to stay regular in your own Bible study and in your own uh, quality prayer times. But we also need it in a corporate way as well uh, because we need the fellowship of one another. That is how God designed it. Uh, we need a church. We need coming together and worshiping God. Uh, see, some people are believers I'm talking about operate as though church was just, was just an afterthought, but Jesus Christ gave his life for the church. You see, we need having corporate Bible study together and encouraging one another. See, so the Bible tells us in no uncertain way that being part of God's family, that helps us and strengthens us to go out there and face the real world on the outside. It equips us to be salt and light out there and excuse me and also to make a real difference in the real world that we function in but in all of that all in all we still need each other that's the way god planned it that's the way god wants it to be so the number one strategy of the world is to try to press you into its mold. See, that's what we call physical, uh, and it try to do it through physical isolation. The second strategy, the second tactic that Babylon uses is mental indoctrination. Let me uh, read uh, verses three and four. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans is just an ancient word for the Babylonians. So here it is, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Mental indoctrination. So they took the brightest young men and indoctrinated them with Babylonian mindsets so that they would effectively represent a Babylonian worldview. Now, some of us would remember uh, Nazi Germany and Hitler's youth movement in the 1930s, at least you would have read about it, where millions of children and millions of teens, they were indoctrinated with rewritten history and uh, distorted biology. Uh, they were indoctrinated about a superior Aryan race. <clears throat> now, Nazi Germany is a historical reminder that education could be used for good and it can be used for evil. So as Christians, <clears throat> we will have to sift through all of the Babylonian mindsets. We would have to sift through all of the secular worldly mindsets with a biblical mindset. 
So, parents, do not only invest in the secular education of your kids. Get them to church to know God better and to know of His ways and to find out His purposes for their lives. They also need to hear what the Bible says about same-sex unions. That is critical today. The LBGTQI movement, the, you know, premarital sex and abortion, the transgender debate, uh, and a host uh, of ungodly things uh, that are taking place right now on the planet. Now, the transgender debate is something that the church needs to gently wade into because there are some hurting people and some confused people who need answers in our world today. But the answers that the world is presenting on that topic, those answers are intellectually and biologically dishonest. Now, do you know that a number of years ago, Facebook added 71, yes, 71 gender identities when you wanted to set up your profile. But after serious pushback, Facebook eventually said, okay, what we'll do is this, we'll allow the people to customize it and let them decide what they want to be, what gender they want to be. Now, that's scary. That's intellectual and biological dishonesty. But for those people, all those people who are confused about gender identity, it does not matter how many surgeries you have or how you personally identify. It will not change your DNA chromosomal, chromosomal makeup that God created you to be, either male or female. Again, I say this with a degree of sensitivity, but I want people to know that transformation that takes place in the heart and the soul and the mind of individuals happens only when a person comes into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, that individual can rest in the wonder and the beauty of the design that uh, God created you to be either male or female. Here how 1 Corinthians 6 uh, puts it. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers, nor effeminate, that's, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor effeminate, nor abusers of, of themselves with mankind. That's the whole LBGTQI and trans uh, trans uh, gender folks uh, uh, there, you know, says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Check this. Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, and such were some of you who were adulterers and effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yes, Jesus can deliver. He can deliver all LBGTQI folks and all who are confused and hurting about gender identity. But personally, I must confess, that I feel very challenged of trying to present that kind of truth that I have uh, been talking about because our culture 
and our environment are being intellectually and biologically dishonest. And also there are loud, loud voices uh, that are drowning out uh, the truth, uh, the truth that you and I believe, uh, the truth that could uh, reach someone, uh, liberating uh, people who would believe in what God's Word says, liberating those same people who are in crisis uh, about their gender, about same-sex unions, about homosexuality and lesbianism, and all those things, uh, God's Word has the power to deliver and liberate them, uh, according to 1 Corinthians. We, you believe that, you know that, I know that, but something about that truth that is being drowned out by the loud voices in our environment. So, we are in a culture right now, a culture that is struggling as regards real truth. And uh, you know what? We have to be involved enough to sift through all of the stuff that those scientists and those judges in, you know, black robes and the majority of people who will try to tell you what is truth today. We have to sift through all of that and stay with the Bible worldview in order to understand what is up from down, what is right from wrong. So we are exposed to all kinds of indoctrination today. So parents, you watch closely what your kids are learning in school because you are the child's educator, not the teacher in the classroom. Now, strategy tactic number three that Babylon uses to try to conform you to its mold. It's called identity alteration. That's one of their other tactics. Verse 7 tells us this, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, unto Hananiah of Shadrach, unto Mishael, Mishael of Meshach, unto Azariah of Abednego. Identity alteration. Now, these are four Jewish young men who had strong Hebrew names given to them back in Israel at birth. Those names were names that reflected a confidence in Jehovah God. Daniel, God is judged. That is what it means. Hananiah, beloved of the Lord. Mishael, who is as God. And Azariah, the Lord is my help. But the Babylonians, they said, no, no, we have to do something about that. We are going to change their identities and give them brand new names. So the prince of the eunuchs gave them Babylonian names that were all related to Babylonian gods. So Daniel became Belshazzar meaning Prince of Baal. Hananiah became Shadrach, meaning illumined by the sun god. Mishael became Meshach, who is like Shak. That's a Babylonian god. Azariah became Abednego, the servant of Nego, another Babylonian god. It was all part of the isolation and indoctrination which gave them a new identity and a Babylonian 
mindset and worldview. But Daniel, you see, never lost sight of who he really was because he was firmly grounded in the Lord. Now, here is another way in closing in which Babylon tried to mess up with the identity of those four Jewish boys. It was mandatory in those days for any male who served in the king's court to be made a eunuch. He was castrated so that there will never ever be the possibility that any one of the males that were serving in the king's court would ever sleep with the queen, get her pregnant, and spoil the seed of the royal line. Now remember that these uh, young men, they were 15 to 16 year olds. They were specially handpicked and they were made eunuchs in the king's court. Now, that's devastating for any man, but 15, 16 year old, they are now coming into manhood and this is what happens to you. You see, Babylon would go to every extreme to get you to see yourself totally and completely in a different way. But for those guys, you could take me from my country. You could take me from my language, from my family. You could take me from my temple, my church. You can take me from my God. You can even remove some physical part of my anatomy. It does not and it will not change who I am in the Lord. And we need to get this too, because too many people have their identities in all kinds of things. People have their identity in a husband, in a wife, in a boyfriend, in a girlfriend, in a job, uh, in a title, in a degree, in some kind of rank, in money, in status, in a house, in a car. But all of those things will either fade away or they are going to fail you. That's why we need to be grounded in who we are in Christ. Finally, Daniel's response to all of this was something called personal resolution. This is what verse 8 says. But Daniel uh, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile him, himself. So here we see the courage of Daniel's convictions. Now remember that he's a teenager. What 15 year old would ever refuse a free buffet dinner and an open wine bar? And besides, mommy and daddy are not even around. But this guy, Daniel, he chose to live by a godly standard. The food is not kosher, so he will not eat it and he will not drink the wine. See? So he goes to Ashpenaz, O prince of the eunuchs. Your king, Nebuchadnezzar, says that it's okay, but my king says that it's not okay. Please, sir, have me excused with my deepest apologies. So, very lamely he responds, but you're going to look sickly. You're going to look real thin and the king will notice you. But the Bible says that Daniel was 
favored by God and his health was more radiant than the rest of all those who function in the court of the king. See, God was honored because Daniel made a personal resolution to honor God more than he wanted to enjoy the delicacies of the world, the delicacies of Babylon. So I pray that the example of Daniel would be a reminder to all of us today that the world will try to absorb you and seduce you into its mold. But we have to go out there and live our lives and rub shoulders with real people and become real influencers. We have to become salt and light, Jesus said. We need to know who we are in Christ and be unmoved and not persuaded to become just like Babylon. Now, it may be a tough call for some people, but God will empower you uh, because of your willingness and your obedience uh, if you dare to be a Daniel for his honor and glory, even in the midst of a difficult and almost impossible world that we live in today. Amen and amen. Let us bow in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of a man who followed you and loved you, a man who held on to his integrity in you, who held on to his faith and his values and his principles for his whole lifetime. So, Father God, help us today to be like that. Help us to be wise above how the world is trying to squeeze us into its mold. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will continue to walk in your light and in your likeness, representing you wherever we go and influencing this world for your honor and for your glory. Amen <clears throat> and amen. And if you would stand for the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. God richly bless you. See you next week.